as the um, Victor already introduced, it's workflows peripheral to the human brain atlas and a live demo. And mostly it's about um, TVB related uh, workflows. Um, if you would like to uh, read more about this, uh, we have this preprint um, at archive. If you Google brain modeling as a service, you should find it. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, let's look at an outline what awaits us in the next 30 to 40 minutes. Um, first, um, we would uh, ask the question, why is protection of workflows that use health data needed in the first place? So um, maybe I should mention this. Um, uh, a lot of the work here is um, about protecting, about data security, actually. Um, so this is not really um, new scientific developments in this sense. Um, it is more how we can package um, workflows such that um, the health data is protected. And why this is necessary, we would start out with this question and then give a quick overview over the different workflows. Um, and some will teach a bit longer, so the virtual brain, TBB multiscale, and TBB zebra. Um, we will only touch briefly and we will talk more about the TBB MRI pipeline as a, um, a prototype of a, of a neuroimaging pipeline which uh, has data that needs to be secured. And then uh, we will talk about TV base, where um, uh, knowledge is mapped onto brain atlas, um, very similar to um, what uh, Timo showed in uh, his awesome presentation. And um, if time allows, I uh, would talk about a little, a little bit of our uh, BITS extension proposal for computational models. So why do we need um, protection for health data? Um, the problem is uh, such an MRI data set, basically every voxel of it is like a fingerprint. Every voxel contains such high dimensional information, such um, deep information uh, about uh, the human behind these data um, that you cannot really pseudonymize this data or anonymize it. So removing the face uh, doesn't solve the problem. Uh, so for example, there's this study from um, Stephen Smith, um, where basically a very simple feature, a very broad feature of functional brain network activity um, allows one, so this is the human connectome project data set. Um, it was in the study was done with, with about 500 subjects and later on it was replicated with the full data set. And this study showed that even with a very simple feature that you can extract from fMRI data, you can, for example, predict a human's fluid intelligence, their life satisfaction, their working memory, uh, whether, um, I don't know, whether they have sleep problems, whether they are depressed, uh, whether, I don't know, highly personal information, basically, that we don't really want to be openly accessible on the internet, right? Um, so this data basically can be downloaded at the moment um, from everyone, uh, from, from every subject of the, every participant of the Human Connectome Project. So people can download this data and can infer the fluid intelligence, the intelligence of the people in this data. And um, although there are no names, of course, in these data and um, metadata, directly identifying metadata is removed, it's still um, possible to reverse engineer and to re-identify the persons which are um, depicted in this data. So um, there are studies that show that even uh, a very thin slice of an FC matrix um, allows to re-identify uh, the person behind this data or um, very, incomplete, very incomplete data sets are enough to re-identify um, the person. And this goes so far that even um, with the human genome project, um, where the, the genomes of, um, of the participants are also openly accessible in the internet, um, it is possible to, to, to reverse engineer the, the, the last names of these persons, um, basically. And by combining this openly accessible genome database, human genome database, with the American phone books, you can basically uh, reverse engineer the gen genetic makeup of every American citizen. And this, of course, is highly problematic. And um, we need to protect uh, or ensure that this doesn't happen, basically. And the European Union has a law for this um, since 2018. It's the General Data Protection Regulation, which clarifies in uh, different laws, basically, how sensitive data should be um, treated. 
And there is this concept uh, in GDPR in Europe uh, of the data controller. Um, so if you have your hands on data, you are a data controller. If you have um, fMRI data, MRI data on your hard drive, you are the data controller of this data because you are able to control it. You are able to process it, to copy it, to delete it, and so on. And with this um, rights or opportunity comes responsibility. You have the responsibility to protect the personal data of these um, uh, participants, basically. Um, and there are. This is very. Uh, this is this is uh, tightly regulated. So right? there are um, precise articles that say that um, by default, personal data may not be made accessible without the individual's intervention to an indefinite number of natural persons, which means you have to ensure that the data you control doesn't end up in the hands of people who are not allowed to have them. Um, and you have also to ensure that the processing you perform is uh, secured. So you have to um, implement technical and organizational measures to mitigate the risks like pseudonymization, encryption. You have to ensure the resilience of systems, restore the availability, adhere to a code of contact, uh, and so on. Um, and um, basically, in the following, we would present workflows that um, help uh, comply with this regulation, basically. Um, let's have a quick look and demo of um, three uh, TVB on eBrain services. Um, the first one, or, or let's start with uh, an overview over the whole infrastructure um, of the TVB on eBrain services. Sorry. So it's a, a complicated picture, a lot of interacting components. Um, the, the, the gist is basically brain modeling requires personal data that is subject to data protection regulation. So we have to protect this data and uh, we do this with access control, encryption and sandboxing. And then eBrains provides a number of core services. I guess you all know uh, these services like a Drive, the file system, the Wiki, the Office, the Lab, the Jupyter Lab uh, instance, the HPC backends and so on. And these services are all uh, connected uh, via a RESTful API. Um, and yeah, just like um, Timo's uh, Zebra toolbox, um, these different software um, packages, they talk to each other uh, via such a RESTful API. And in eBrains, we have a client um, which, um, and, and also the supercomputers, we also talk with the supercomputers via such an API. And in uh, eBrains, um, uh, it is, there's made use of um, the Pi Unicore, Unicore um, which is a wrapper basically for uh, such an um, API, uh, RESTful API. So the RESTful API consists of HTTP methods um, where client and a server uh, uh, talk to each other and send metadata um, back in the responses. And um, Unicore provides a number of functions, basically uh, wrappers that let you um, uh, talk between client and server and also let you operate a supercomputer. So um, this is this is the, the main uh, uh, focus of Unicore that you can um, operate a supercomputer. Um, in this case, from a, uh, using Python code. So I can remove directories. I can make directories. I can upload things. I can uh, just execute uh, usual Linux Unix commands uh, via this wrapper, basically. Um, then let's have a look at uh, the virtual brain on eBrains. So in eBrains, uh, or in general, the, uh, the original deployment of the virtual brain was in um, compiled standalone versions for Windows and Mac OS and Linux. And um, later it became also a library that you can just directly um, uh, call from your Python code and is also available as a Docker container image. On eBrains, um, then you already saw this um, a few times today. There is this programmatic interface um, in Jupyter Hub where you just call the TBB library and can start working with it. But there is also um, the GUI, the, the TBB GUI, the graphical user interface is also served over the web um, as a website. Um, so the, the GUI, as you know it, is now here served from eBrains. Um, over the web. Um, I can uh, log out here and, and demonstrate. I, I log in here with my um, eBrains username. And then I'm here with, I have to move the window a little bit around here. Um, I, can, I have here the TDB GUI and I can 
uh, start a project, um, simulator, the whole functionality basically. Um, and this GUI now is also connected to backend supercomputing resources. So depending on the complexity of your simulation, um, it will either be performed on what we call front end nodes or on back end nodes where uh, which directly uh, sit on, on, uh, on the Pitt Stain supercomputer in uh, Switzerland in the CSCS supercomputing center. And um, of course, uh, this workflow needs to be protected. Um, so we have here a front end, uh, the TBB web interface, and we have a back end uh, somewhere sitting on a supercomputer, a shared resource used by many people um, where the simulation is uh, integrated and computed. So um, before you can upload your data there, you must already encrypt it. Um, so that it, uh, yeah, that this this basically can demonstrate basically that uh, when the data left your hard drive, it was in a secure state. So this is good for you as a data controller, basically. Um, so to um, upload the data encrypted, TBB provides a public key. Um, this is public private key cryptography. Everyone can have the public key. It can only be used to encrypt the data and the corresponding private key is hidden, buried somewhere deep inside TBB. No one may see it and it can be used then only for decrypting the data. And uh, so the data is uploaded to TBB, it is immediately decrypted and then immediately re-encrypted uh, with a new key, uh, which is then um, completely secret and uh, on a project basis. So every new project you upload will get a new key, will be uh, uh, encrypted with a different secret, such that a secret such that if a secret leaks to the outside, um, we minimize the amount of leaked data, basically. Um, and then, basically, when uh, TBB, when or when you decided to execute this computation on the backend, um, the front end and the back end, they will talk to each uh, to each other, and uh, the the uh, data will again be encrypted before it is sent to the backend and will only be there then uh, decrypted inside a container. We can have, um, again, a quick look at this workflow, which I just verbally described. So uh, we um, authenticate with TVB, TVB calls the, uh, the eBrains key cloak, um, the, the user management system where all the users are managed and registered and checks whether this is a registered user, which is, uh, who is allowed to use TBB. Um, and then uh, we will upload the file, we uh, encrypt it again um, for upload to the supercomputer. A job is created and the data is uh, sent to the supercomputer. And on the supercomputer, the data is then only decrypted inside a container. So this is a docker uh, slash Zaro slash singularity um, image container when the whole software um, is, is uh, given, uh, is basically uh, this whole software environment is, is uh, given basically. And um, only inside this shield environment. So the, the container is a kind of a sandbox. Um, it, especially Cyrus containers um, unshare um, the, the namespaces. Um, we will come to, to sandboxing later in more detail, but um, it basically, um, even the same user cannot look at this data. So it's really secure inside the container. Um, we already had um, multi-scale simulation today um, at, at various points. So um, just um, a quick um, yeah, mentioning here, uh, TBB multi-scale, the idea is basically that the large scale activity of TBB brain nodes, large scale nodes, inform the input of um, that the, the spiking neurons reserve, uh, receive basically and um, vice versa when the spiking neurons um, um, show a certain activity we can compute mean fields from that and can use this to inform large-scale activity and this exists also um, in a variety of different deployments we have this docker image and uh, where everything directly runs out of the box, can just pull it and run it everywhere. The Python library also, and TBB Nest is fully um, integrated in um, uh, TBB by now. 
And uh, also, um, in addition to the normal lab, there's also this entry point for TDB Nest here, where you can um, access contributed notebooks and also store your, your own notebooks persistent and run Jupyter notebooks. Then um, we have the connection with the Zebra toolbox. Um, so uh, as Timo uh, showed, um, there's uh, yeah, really cool things you can do with, with Zebra. And here is just uh, one um, application of, uh, of Zebra. Basically, we can get receptor densities for our different brain regions. And then can basically, as uh, Jan, uh, I think, also mentioned, we can set the parameters to, of different brain regions according to such microstructural properties like receptor densities, for example. Um, this can also then be visualized um, with this uh, visualizer here that we have, uh, where basically uh, all the different kinds of um, features we can assign to an atlas, to a brain map, uh, can be projected onto the cognitive surface. Okay, and now let's um, go to the TVB image processing pipeline. And now we will look a bit closer at these um, mechanisms for um, protecting the data. So the, uh, the, the goal of the pipeline is um, we take magnetic resonance imaging data as input and want this brain network model um, description as an output. So structural connectomes, functional connectomes, maybe region average, fMRI time series, and so on. So as input, we have the T1-weighted uh, MRI, diffusion-weighted MRI, um, maybe T2-weighted MRI to, to help the registration or also to export um, gradients and um, the functional MRI. And the, the output, um, standard output is, we have these functional connectivity matrices, the structural connectivity matrices, the basis for the brain network models. We have region-wise fMRI, surface triangulations, protection matrices for protecting the um, data that is simulated at the level of brain regions at the source level to the um, space of sensors like EEG or MEG. And we have brain maps, oscillations used um, during the processing. And um, basically such image processing pipelines are nowadays uh, implemented uh, or deployed in the form of robust software bundles basically. Um, so there are many of those. So this is just one example what basically you can use all and combine all kinds of container images to perform such a pipeline processing. So in this case we have um, chosen the MRTX3 connectome Docker container image for the structural um, processing, the tractography, uh, and fMRI prep uh, for the functional um, processing. But of course you can also use for example the um, processing pipelines from the human connectome project. They also exist as Docker containers and so on. And um, the last container is um, our in-house container, which takes the results from uh, structural and functional processing and puts it and post-processes it such that uh, we get the desired brain network model uh, data out of it. Um, and how would this then practically look such a workflow? Um, we would upload our encrypted MRI data to eBrain's drive. Then we forward it from there to the, uh, to the, um, to the supercomputer. Then we would configure the processing uh, with a Jupyter notebook on eBrain's lab. And then on the supercomputer, an orchestrator basically performs more, most of, the, um, of the, the logic of the workflow, basically of the security aspects. So it performs the decryption, encryption, and uh, runs the containers, schedules the containers, um, generates these batch scripts that um, you need in order to send jobs to the um, job scheduler of the supercomputer. And when we're done with this, we can then download the encrypted results. Now, what are the risks in such a workflow? Um, so uh, data can be intercepted during transit. Um, we use the internet for data transmission, and this is an open network um, where everyone can listen in. Normally, um, data packets are encrypted when they are sent, um, but yeah, you never know. So you have to explicitly do this <laughs> in some cases. If you don't, then uh, you're communicating over an open channel. Then uh, there is a break-in on a device. So uh, whether the device is running or even a decommissioned supercomputer, there still may still be data stored on it. Um, so a supercomputer is used by many people. 
um, and the isolation between the different uses of the supercomputer is only logical. This is software. And we, uh, in, in, these, in the last days and weeks, we heard very often when such isolation failed and hackers um, were able to cross these walls that separate different users. And now in order to solve these problems, um, so our main problem is basically that health data shall be secured by default. So practically, basically we don't, we don't want that this health data can be re read at all. So if we encrypt it, um, our problem is actually solved, right? If we have the data always encrypted, then no one can read it then it's always secure. So we can do anything we like with our MRI data sets. Uh, we can have them even on insecure in insecure spaces. It doesn't matter because they are encrypted. Um, no one uh, can do any damage with it. This comes, of course, with a second problem then if they are always encrypted, we cannot use them. So there must be a short time window where we must be allowed to decrypt the data and use it. And um, during this time window, then um, sandboxes or temporary mount file systems or authenticated data containers um, would basically provide a form of isolation where the, the data is encapsulated in a, in a sandbox um, such that um, even, um, uh, even the same user, I mean, the same user account shouldn't be able to access it, uh, which would be um, important for shared user accounts. So encryption. Um, really a fundamental technology of our modern world makes uh, structured data, turns it into such an um, gibberish basically. And um, if we ensure that unencrypted data um, is never written out directly on a file system and unencrypted personal data may only exist in temporary file systems that are isolated from the host computer, then uh, we should be fine because it's basically impossible um, to to use this data by another um, operator of the system. So the, one of the basic ideas here is that as long that basically the walls, the confinements of your computing space extend beyond your computer and stretch into a supercomputer. The idea is basically that you never cease control as a data controller. You always stay in control and no other human operator would um, ever be able to look at this data. If anything goes wrong, the system just wipes everything clean. Um, uh, and, and by in this way, basically, the system shall ensure that if no one else can access it, and if the data controller always stays in control, then we're in a situation basically where uh, we are compliant with GDPR and uh, the data is safe. Um, so what would probably be good is that personal data is encrypted before it leaves the computer of the data controller and stays encrypted at all times, except during the processing. And then um, the nice thing about public uh, key cryptography is um, that basically we do not need to share our secrets in the open. So we, um, we can communicate over unsafe channels and uh, we can use unsafe infrastructures um, due to this public uh, key cryptography because the public key can always be shared. It is only useful to encrypt the data. It cannot be used to decrypt the data. Only with the corresponding private key, the data can be decrypted. And this allows, so this is behind all modern communication basically and finance and everything uh, needs this. This is really foundational for um, for our, our modern world. And here we can use the same principle basically for uh, securing uh, our health data such that, um, yeah, we don't need to exchange passwords or anything over the internet. We can always just share these safe keys basically. And sandboxing basically means that we provide only a controlled set of resources like storage, network access, memory, um, CPU resources to a process. And uh, we all, all use sandboxes all the time. So every app that you have on your iPhone is always sandboxed. You always have to give the app uh, privileges, for example, to uh, look at your photos and so on. And this is usually only a problem for shared accounts. So the normal user isolation on Linux computers works, um, but uh, as soon as what, is, what happens in eBrain's uh, accounts are shared by different persons, um, the, this, this boundary doesn't hold anymore. So um, unencrypted personal data and secrets may only be written into such sandboxes or temporary mount file systems that are not even written on a disk or anything. They just exist in RAM, in main memory. 
And with this, they are entirely invisible from the host. And um, so this, it's, it's a built-in feature that if anything goes wrong, if there's a power outage or something, then everything is just deleted. Everything is just wiped. And the idea is that we, of course, only provide as much resources, as much namespaces as needed. And how would such a workflow then uh, look like? So this is now the high level overview. And in a second, um, I will then demonstrate the, um, the, the, the fine grained workflow. And yeah, this is very technical, um, but it can be mapped, I think, to um, a lot of different um, workflows and setups. So we start by authenticating. Uh, we start from the computer of the data controller and authenticate with eBrains. Uh, and from then, eBrains takes, uh, has tokens for you, basically, that um, convey your uh, identity to other systems. And from that moment on, all the systems can communicate and convey decisions about whether you are authorized to do something or not um, to all other systems. So we authenticated, and then we can log into the supercomputer, and there is a sandbox then started. And then only inside the sandbox, we generate the public and private key pair. Um, and so the private key, the secret, is always in this shielded container. It, it cannot be accessed from another location of the supercomputer. Same thing we do on the data controller's computer. We also generate a public key and a private key. And now we exchange these public keys. So these can be shared over the internet, no problem. The, the public key that we generated on the supercomputer and sent to the data controller will now be used from, by the data controller to encrypt their data for the upload. Vice versa, the public key that was created on the data controller's computer can then later be used by the pipeline processing to encrypt the results and send the results back to the data controller without ever sharing any passwords or secrets. Okay, and now let's step by step um, go through this workflow. So um, basically, um, we don't have uh, an average human data currently available to eBrains. So um, to obtain input data, um, you have to make sure whether you have a legal basis for obtaining this data. So it's possible or still in the EU to download, um, for example, human connectome project data or from your open neuro, but it's not really clarified whether you are legally allowed actually for using this data. This depends on the consent that the data subject gave to the usage of the data. Um, so this is uh, the overview of, of the data again uh, we're using. So we have data in bits format. So we have anatomical T1 data, diffusion rated data with face reversed images to correct for um, um, gradient distortions, and we have functional data. And then uh, we have our cloud workflow that involves six subsystems. So we have the user's computer, we have the eBrains uh, drive or collaboratory where the data is stored. Then we have eBrains lab where we um, control things. Then we have the supercomputer login mode, um, the place where people log into a supercomputer. We have the HPC uh, storage where data is stored and we have the HPC compute node where the actual um, computation happens. Um, so, uh, out of, I was a bit anxious that uh, the demo, uh, that, that something goes wrong with Ebrain's lab. So I basically slidified the whole demo, but uh, we can also, um, it, it should work now. So I, I will just uh, uh, try it out. So uh, we, we, we don't need to show this. We, we log in um, at Ebrain's and we create a collab and then we copy the pipeline to the collab. So the, this orchestrator script is basically a shell script um, that is, um, I can click on my browser window because there's a Zoom window. So here's the TVB pipeline wiki cola. And there is this um, the drive, is this orchestrator script. So you would uh, download the orchestrator script and then create a new cola. Um, so you should always create a new cola, your workspace in which you work basically. And then um, yeah, we upload the pipeline there. And then we uh, go to lab and uh, open the TPP pipeline um, Jupyter node. I can do this here. So here we have, um, so this is in uh, shared. Um, all, all these collabs can be accessed via shared, the shared folder, and then um, TPP pipeline. And there uh, is this uh, the shell script and notebooks are um, version 1.1 is with encryption. And um, 
So what happens here is we have this um, Unicode client, we fetch the token that was, so after authentication, we got a token and we fetch it. And this allows us now to connect to the supercomputer. Uh, we can show here, I'm, yeah, so my supercomputing account is mapped to the eBrains account. Um, so, but uh, eBrains also wants to provide supercomputing resources via shared accounts. So in this case, I have a private account, but um, for shared accounts, um, we need sandboxes. And we have storages here. Um, this is basically Unicore's way of um, providing um, file systems. So here we can uh, basically folders are endpoints here in, in such an API basically. Um, and then we just look, so here we just look for the home folder now. And um, so of course, this is just for demonstration purposes. We, we find it click, uh, quicker than um, anyway. So you shouldn't use the home folder normally, but the scratch folder for, for actually processing things because it's more performed, a more performant file system. And now uh, we create some folders where we'll upload the data and where we'll then um, receive the, um, the computing results. So this always takes a while. Um, and meanwhile, I can log into the supercomputer. Okay, it's done here. We can have a look here. Okay, we have two new folders, input and output basically, now existent here. And then uh, we upload uh, this pipeline script to the supercomputer. And now this pipeline orchestrator script has um, four modes, basically. The first mode, so you, you provide these modes as command line arguments, basically. And, um, oops, uh, let it go here. Uh, the, the first mode does nothing else than pulling containers. Um, so it uh, creates batch scripts for the, the job scheduler um, and does nothing else than uh, Saru's pull and then the Docker, uh, the, the, the image containers basically. Um, at the moment we fixed it to these three containers I mentioned earlier, but of course here we could just add this at command line. So, container and then you just type in some container and it will it will take these so this can be easily made more generic basically um, so let's let's just uh, try this out um, okay so um, what happened now is um, yeah so um, the, the, the pipeline generated these three bash scripts, basically. Normally they are instantly deleted, but here for, ah, they are, they are already deleted, okay. Um, they just exist for a short time, they are necessary and they are deleted again. But this is just like the, the control script for a supercomputer and then the pipeline write, writes out some uh, status information, what happened. So yeah, we started mode one, generate the batch files to pull the containers, containers pulled and so on and exit. Um, maybe I will switch to the slides for the sake of time that we speed up a li little bit. I think it's not so much time left. Um, so that we come to the more important points. So after the containers were pulled, um, we now start a daemon that runs on the front end node. And basically what this daemon does, it generates this public private key pair for the data upload. So um, yeah, and, and then after that, the daemon basically runs and runs and runs and waits until the supercomputing job on the supercomputer on the actual compute node starts. And why is this necessary? This is necessary because the daemon will um, safely keep the secret for, for the time. So we, to, to ensure that the secret is never written out, we keep it in a running process basically where we know it is isolated. And um, basically the, this daemon um, pushes the secrets further from. So we, we start with secrets on the US computer and uh, move these more and more on. So there's, again, always a pair of systems that communicate with each other and moves these systems from one place to another without writing anything out and just keeping it in main memory, basically. So here uh, we generate upload keys. This is um, a Python script inside um, the, the container, the, this, this TVB pipeline converter container. And then um, it basically it, it runs a, a while loop and just waits until um, the compute node starts. And during this time now, 
the um, yeah, now the, the data controller knows, ah, my public key is there. I can now download it. The data controller downloads the public key. And um, now the data controller can on their, um, on their computer encrypt the input data uh, with this public key um, and um, upload it to the supercomputer. Um, and also, it also produced a return key that is then um, uh, used by the job on the supercomputer to return the results. And um, at this point, then um, the main pipeline uh, job can be submitted. And um, this would then start a sandbox on the compute node this time and a temporary notify system that's invisible from the host. And there we generate then keys again in order to pull the data from the login node or the storage uh, to be more price, pr precise to the compute node basically or into the running process of the compute node to be more price, uh, precise. So we first decrypt the password for the private key for the input and then we decrypt the input. Then we um, uh, process the data and then uh, we again encrypt the results um, using the public key from the data controller and um, give the data back to eBrains and uh, to the user's computer. Um, this was the TVB on eBrains workflow. Um, now, um, just please interrupt me when, when, when we should stop. Um, just a few um, words on mapping biological knowledge uh, onto brain atlases. Um, this is the idea is to mine knowledge from literature and databases and map it to brain atlases. Um, so um, the, the basic idea is we have a text mining tool um, that um, scans through the whole literature, PubMed and so on, and also databases. Um, this is, these are mesh terms, this is a controlled ontology, a controlled uh, database of controlled terms. And um, basically um, one can enter any free text and um, uh, like uh, uh, Alzheimer, like Hippocampus, and so on. And then um, the software will basically um, first look in which publications these terms occur. And then it will look in the um, Uberon ontology. The Uberon ontology um, associates biom uh, is an ontology of, of biomedical knowledge. Like, for example, here, a lung, um, an alveolus is part of a lung. And with this um, knowledge graph, basically, um, we can compute um, something like um, weights for different words, um, like um, the word hippocampus would get a high weight with relation to Alzheimer, for example. And um, with this, we can map all kinds of words onto brain regions, basically. So uh, these Uberon terms that are associated with neuropathological diseases can then, um, they are also, they also contain brain regions. Um, so here we map these brain regions to different atlases basically. And um, with this, we can map any kind of free text word onto a brain atlas basically. Um, and this is the, um, uh, shown here basically. Um, uh, this is TVB, TV base um, package. And um, yeah, so here we, we access this. Um, I will not click it now because we are late in time. It takes about 30 seconds. And uh, it will then pull from this Skyview database, basically, um, this ontological relationships and um, parse through them. And um, uh, we can then finally uh, map this or plot this onto a brain surface, basically. It takes a while, it takes a few seconds. And we can use, so here we use basically the, the keyword memory, um, uh, the, the concept memory, actually a controlled term uh, in these ontologies. And we can see then how relevant is the word memory, for example, for different brain regions. So here we can see the hippocampus and the frontal cortex are obviously very relevant for brain regions. And this could also then be used um, actually to inform um, parameters. It's, it's a not so uh, straightforward way to inform parameters, like for example, gradients that are derived from imaging data. But um, it could lead to interesting results. Um, and I think I'm done now. Um, yeah, yeah, you need to wrap up, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, wrapping, I'm wrapping it up now. Um, so the last point was just that uh, we have um, a proposal for extending the bits standard uh, for uh, computational models. The basic idea is that we add an ID at the end of each file, um, which is a hash 
of the contents of the metadata, while the metadata contains a hash of the contents of the data. And with this, we en ensure basically the integrity, authenticity, and volatility um, of the data. This is similar to a checksum, and this could lead to a uh, more um, reproducible bit standard in the future. And that was it. Thank you.